And we will call a subcommittee to order in the Government Organization Committee. Um, we have a few members here already present. I don't know who was first. Um, Mr. Calder. Mr. Calder, who's, who's Calderon? Mr. Calderon, SB 305. No, who's, where's the sign-in sheet? No, no, we're going to Yeah. Whoever, I think he was, I think Mrs. Mrs. Simini was. I, I, yes, I understand. With, I understand, Senator. There's indulgence. It'll be okay, brief. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. Excuse me. We're, we're, we're in subcommittee, so I'm going to call the meeting to order. Do we have enough to establish a quorum yet? No? All right. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Calderon, you may begin. To the gentleman from Compton and uh, committee members, uh, thank you so much for allowing me to present SB uh, 305. Very simple and straightforward measure. Currently, uh, a mini satellite wagering facility for horse racing is licensed. Thank you. For a period of two years, this bill will increase that time to five years. For those sites looking to invest into the horse racing industry by offering this type of wagering, this change will provide a level of assurance, reassurance that their investment will have time to see a return. 305 has no opposition. I have previously been passed through the Senate on consent. I ask for your eye vote. I just allowed you to continue speaking because I love to hear your voice along with all the other members here. Uh, but uh, we do not have a quorum yet. This, but, but we can ask questions. We can have uh, questions. So why don't you go ahead, uh, Mr. V. Manny Pettis. Mr. Calderon, uh, Senator Calderon, thank you for bringing this bill forward. I, I have a couple uh, in my district and the city of Indio, and I know that they would appreciate this. Uh, I don't have a question. I was just wanting to ask if I could be a co-author. Absolutely. Welcome your uh, co-authorship. Thank you, sir. M Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chesbro. I just have a suggestion for the author, and that is if you please go back over to the other house and, re and tell them to be as nice as we, to us as we are to senators. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will send that, that uh, message along. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, would you like to hear my lovely voice? Uh, are you going to sing? He's going to sing. No, uh, please. I, 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 I have a couple of numbers ready. Spare the members of the state of California uh, okay. assembly. I appreciate that. Uh, I have a question. Since 208, uh, why have we only had two of these uh, mini satellite facilities uh, open in California? Mr. Chairman and members, Rod Blunyan, on behalf of the Commerce Club in Los Alamitos in support. Uh, it took the CHRB a little bit of time to get the regs uh, put together. They did. Uh, also, in order to site one of these facilities, uh, the uh, local jurisdiction has to find appropriate zoning for the facility. That has been a challenge in a number of communities. And uh, since the Commerce facility was the first one, we're now expanding it. And uh, there are a number of others, I think, that will be coming forward soon. We also have tried to put one at the Lucky Chances Card Club in Colma, and we've been stopped by San Mateo County, but I think we're about ready to to solve that problem, so hopefully that can open as well. Uh, the Commerce facility is averaging about 80000 a day in handle, and most of that is new handle. And, you know, if we could wave a wand and get 30 of these, it would really help the industry. But uh, <laughs> my magic wand has run out of juice. <laughs> Very well. Thank you for uh, your response. Uh, is there another, any other comments? Do we have enough to stop this quorum? We're still, uh, sergeants, can you please call the absent members? Um, Mr. Calder, would you like to close? Uh, yes, just ask for your support uh, when you do have a uh, quorum. Thank you. Thank you. This is a, uh, a due pass recommendation, by the way. Correct. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members? Mr. S uh, Senator Simidian, thank you for your patience. Uh, we're going to hear SB 445. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The only reason for my impatience is that they're about to lift the call on a dozen worthy assembly bills in education across the <laughs> that, hall. You know what? I, I will wanna, make sure we and limit. I wanna, and I want to be there. To I, and I want you to be both, there. Both so we will limit our questions, sir. Thank you. And I'll try and keep it brief, <laughs> sir. Thank you. <laughs> Members, this is Senate Bill 445. It makes a couple of minor but uh, significant changes to current law to bring it up to date with 21st century technology. 
Uh, on a typical day, probably a million Californians visit a library, and that's a good thing. Uh, but one of the things that we need to do to uh, make our libraries 21st century institutions is change the term registration and circulation to patron use records in existing law to provide privacy protection for those one million users. The measure was proposed by one of my constituents from Cupertino, a library law consultant named Mary Minow. She is here with us today. Welcome. And uh, I would simply ask her to testify on behalf of the bill. Please, uh, welcome. Mr. Chair and members, I'm Mary Minow of Cupertino. And readers are increasingly leaving digital tracks, deeper and deeper tracks that show what they're reading, inquiring about, and consulting in libraries. I'm very concerned about the vulnerability of the private information that Californians are unwittingly leaving when they interact online with our libraries. The American Library Association has a code of ethics that protects reader privacy. Freedom to read loses its meaning if you fear that somebody's monitoring what you're reading. The Code of Ethics states, we protect each library user's right to privacy and confidentiality with respect to information sought or received and resources consulted, borrowed, acquired, or transmitted. The California Public Records Law has uh, and Pam, if you don't mind, I would like to establish a quorum. The most important moment of the day. Sir. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, Madam Secretary, we call the uh, roll, please. Paul. Paul here. Ms. Dandy. Here. Atkins. Here. Block. Blumenfield. Chesbro. Here. Cook. Galgiani. Garrett. Here. Gatto. Hill. Jeffries. Here. Ma. Perea. Here. Perez. Here. Silva. Here. Block here. Yep. Okay, we do have a quorum. Sorry for the interruption. You may continue. Thank you. Um, although the pu public library records are open records, there is an exception that's been in place and worked well over the last 30 years. It currently protects patron registration and circulation records with exceptions as needed. Today it needs to be updated to protect patron use records to reflect the new records that users create when they're interacting with the library resources, like email addresses. I'm aware that marketers and political campaign offices in Florida have asked libraries for patron email addresses, and in Oregon the legislature passed a bill specifically to protect library patron email addresses. And we have a lot more than email addresses as patrons answer questions by email, by chat, they search our databases um, without ever borrowing or circulating a book. Concretely, this bill would give the same protection to someone who's looking up articles or information online, say abuse or an embarrassing disease, as it gives to somebody who checks out the books from the library. A uh, recent study showed that the top three subjects that people search on library internet computers are education, employment, and health. So the law needs to be updated to protect patron confidentiality, whether they're offline or on. Please vote aye on SB 445. It's been moved and second. Is, are there any other witnesses in favor? Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Christina Dillon DeCaro representing the California Library Association. We were the sponsors of the original bill by Senator Roberti in 1980. I'm just here as a resource if you have any questions and strong support. Very well. Any other witnesses? Any witnesses in opposition? Um, uh, Senator Samidi, would you like to close? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to my knowledge, there is no opposition to the bill. Strong bipartisan support on the Senate side. We have, I want to underscore, we have left intact the provisions governing the ability of law enforcement to access such records. So all of those pr provisions are still there. They remain intact. The only thing we've done is redefine the definition of records so we all know what it is that is, in fact, being kept private and confidential absent an appropriate inquiry. Respectfully ask for an aye vote. Very, very well. Any questions from the members? I, I, I neglected to ask your questions for the members. Please. Yeah, just real quickly. I, I support the bill. I appreciate your efforts to, to work on privacy with the Internet. It seems that there's nothing private anymore. And ev any effort we can to, to push back a little bit and do that, we've been dealing with toll evaders and privacy issues with them and street sweeping privacy issues and and now we have, you know, another bill that if you buy an electric vehicle, every utility is going to know the name of every person who buys an electric vehicle, private utilities. This, I, I really appreciate you doing this, and, and I want to support the bill. Thank, Thank you. you very much, sir. Any other uh, questions from the members? Let me just note for the record that the colonel is present and late. 
Uh, any any other members uh, with uh, any comments? Uh, could I respond to that, please? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't respond to the fact that we had a veterans tribute and you weren't there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I think all this information should be private. My <laughs> Mr. S uh, Senator Savidia, thank you for thank you. Uh, this bill, and thank you for your witnesses uh, before us today. Uh, seeing no other questions for the members, will you please call the roll? Hall. Hall, aye. Hall, uh, aye. Ms. Standy? Aye. Ms. Standy, aye. Atkins? Aye. Atkins, aye. Block? Aye. Block, aye. Bloomingfield? Chesbro? Cook? Aye. <laughs> Cook, I, Galgiani. Aye. Galgiani, I, Garrick. Aye. Garrick, I, Gatto. Hill. Jeffries. Aye. Jeffries, I, Ma. Perea. Aye. Perea, I, Perez. Aye. Perez, I, Silva. Aye. Silva, I, Torres. Okay, uh, Senator Smith, thank you so much. That bill is out. Thank you again. I got to go okay. vote for some assembly bills. I'll see you okay. shortly. All right. <laughs> uh, Senator. We'll take up Senator Calderon's SB, uh, item 4, SB 305. Uh, Madam, yeah. it's been moved. And second. And second. Uh, please call the roll. Hall. Hall, aye. Hall, aye. Ms. Standy. Aye. Ms. Standy, aye. Atkins. Aye. Atkins, aye. Block. Aye. Block, aye. Bloomingfield. Chesbro. Cook. Aye. Cook, aye. Galgiani. Aye. Galgiani, aye. Garrick. Aye. Garrick, aye. Gatto. Hill. Jeffries. Aye. Jeffries, aye. Ma. Perea. Perea, I press. Press, I Silva. Silva, I Torres. Okay, that bill is out. We'll move to item. We'll move the consent calendar. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, please call the roll. Hall. Hall, I. Hall, I, Nastandy. Nastandy, I Atkins. Atkins, I Block. Block, I Bloomingfield. Chesbro. Cook. I. Cook, I, Galgiani. Galgiani, I, Garrick. Aye. Garrick, I, Gatto. Hill. Jeffries. Aye. Jeffries, I, Ma. Freya. Freya, I, Press. Press, I, Silva. Aye. Silva, I, Torres. Okay. Uh, Senator Padilla, SB 39. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members of the committee, before you is SB. Uh, 39, which I introduced in response to uh, way too many headlines involving beers with added caffeine uh, and the incidents that we've heard about uh, of students uh, blacking out, being rushed to hospitals, uh, suffering uh, tremendous, tremendous physical harm uh, because of these drinks known as blackout in a can. Uh, they were introduced into the marketplace in 2005 and have led uh, to tragedies at Central Washington University. It's been moved in second. Ramapo College in New Jersey, St. Joe's College in Philadelphia, and even here in California. Uh, these products uh, have been found uh, dangerous by both the Food and Drug Administration as well as the Federal Trade Commission uh, when in November of 2010 they issued a warning statement to the manufacturers of these caffeinated beers. These uh, federal agencies label the drinks as adulterated, unsafe, and illegal. Uh, at the time, there was a voluntary request that companies remove them from the marketplace. Uh, unfortunately, that request was indeed that, voluntary. And should the federal position of uh, what these products represent ever change, I want to make sure that California law is abundantly clear. You cannot manufacture it here. You cannot sell it here. You cannot provide it uh, here in the state of California. With this bill, California would join the growing list of states that includes Massachusetts, New York, Washington, Utah, Michigan, Connecticut, Ohio, and Kansas by instituting a ban. Uh, I want to speak to a couple of the provisions of this bill. And there's been questions or concern about uh, what products this uh, bill would apply to. The current bill would affect products to which caffeine has been directly added as a separate ingredient. Uh, I think on behalf of ABC, uh, the uh, beverage industry and others, uh, there's a consensus around the definitions included in the bill. Uh, I know on the Senate side there was concern about how this could possibly apply to mixed drinks uh, in a bar or even craft beers. Uh, you know, craft beers are not touched, and uh, if you want to mix your Red Bull and vodka, you'll still be able to do that uh, in a bar. This bill does not speak to that. It only speaks to the uh, blackout in a can that I referenced earlier, uh, the uh, beverages that are uh, 
uh, either bottled or, or canned and represent the equivalent of five cans of beer and one cup of coffee in a single serving. With me in support of the bill today is uh, Tom Redfrey, the Executive Director of the County Alcohol and Drug Program Administrators Association of California. Thank Very you. well. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, uh, Tom Renfrey with the County Alcohol and Drug Program Administrators. We oversee the public system of care for the prevention and treatment of uh, alcohol and other drug problems in the counties. Among the increasing numbers of young people that we're seeing in our treatment programs, one of the biggest problems is underage and binge drinking, which probably doesn't come as a surprise to anyone here. Uh, we believe the availability of caffeinated alcoholic beverages are a major contributor to underage and binge drinking. These products are marketed in such a way as to appeal to young people. And because the caffeine added to these drinks partially masks the effects of the alcohol, youth tend to drink more. They mistakenly think they're not getting drunk when, in fact, their alcohol blood levels are way over the legal limit. The fact is that young people who consume these drinks engage in risky behaviors that endanger their, their health and the lives of others. Uh, the American Journal of Preventive Medicine study found that drinkers who consumed cabs had a threefold risk of leaving the bars highly intoxicated, a fourfold risk of intending to drive after drinking. And they found also that students who consumed these drinks were more likely to experience a variety of drinking related negative consequences. Uh, so as we think that this bill is a good preventative measure and our administrators are fully in support. Thank you. Thank you. Any other witness here to testify in favor? Nicole Wortelman on behalf of the Alameda County, County Board of Supervisors and Ventura County Board of Supervisors. In Ventura County, the sheriff and police officers have found that these particular beverages are the beverages of choice in high school students and junior college students because it allows them to dance all night and stay awake instead of your normal passing out when you've uh, consumed too much alcohol. Uh, they found them to be very dangerous and are in strong support of SB 39. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, any other witnesses in support? Judy Etter with Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Um, we are in fully support of this bill. Thank you. Brian Spencer with the California Medical Association in support of the measure. Thank you. Chris Walker, the California Small Brewers Association. Uh, we had some concerns at the beginning of the process. I want to thank the author and his staff for working through the issues. Things like espresso stouts in the craft beer industry could have been caught up, and we do appreciate uh, the distinction and clarifications that were made in the bill. We, we have removed our opposition and support the bill. Very well. Thank you for working with the author. Uh, next witness. Mr. Robert Chair. Harris, on behalf of the California Society of Addiction Man Medicine, and we'd rather see problems stop before they start. Thank you for your testimony. Next witness. Yep. Mr. Chair, members, Fred Jones on behalf of the California Council on Alcohol Problems. We do have a support if amended position. We understand the author, though, has been working with industry to try to resolve concerns, and we don't want to disrupt that balance. So I just want to place a marker, <laughs> to use a gambling term, that if industry reformulates these products such that they remove the caffeine, but then they start putting in natural additives, and your uh, analysis references three of them, which some of them, by the way, are already doing. And they place it on the front of their label to advertise them for their stimulant impacts. Then maybe we need to return to this committee and expand this um, beyond just what the FDA was willing to do. So just wanted to place that marker on the table maybe for the future. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Duly noted. Any uh, witnesses in opposition? Uh, questions from the members? Mr. Nistande. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess my question is, how do you decipher, differ differentiate between, as you said, you can still mix uh, well, whatever you want to call it, you know, the uh, liqueurs with you know, Bailey's cream and coffee or the Red Bull and vodka, whatever it might be. How do, you, how do you decide that's okay, but then this one's not? How do you draw that line? <laughs> well, I think uh, what you'll find, you can't find Red Bull and vodka in a prepackaged can available in the store. You know, if you want to go up to a, a, the bar and order one at a, at a bar or a restaurant, you can certainly do that or make one at home. Uh, the point is these, these were uh, targeting uh, prepackaged uh, in a can, could be in a bottle, but in a can is what we've seen uh, in the last several years uh, really exploding in the marketplace. So if, if, if I'm just picking on a product, but Bailey's and, you know, whatever they, they want to mix with the coffee or whatever, if they put that then into a product, that would be illegal, but they could serve that mixture in a bar then. Correct. What about the, uh, the craft beer exemption? 
Yeah, and, and the way uh, uh, we arrived at sort of that, that understanding that addresses the issue we're trying to get at and doesn't affect them adversarially is the specific language of caffeine added separately. Uh, you know, if you have coffee uh, as one of the ingredients in a beer, for example, well, yeah, coffee has caffeine. Everybody knows that. But that's sort of naturally occurring in that ingredient that's being used for flavor, et cetera. If you're, you know, trying to add caffeine powder, if you will, uh, just for the per sole purpose of uh, in infusing a product with a stimulant, that's a whole different ballgame. And so that's what allowed us to uh, work through the issues and arrive at the language that's here before you. Did you wrestle with the issue that the gentleman there brought up about if, if you have other stimulants, whatever that might be, put into a product? Did you go through that process of not yeah, to and, and we them? continue to, to consider, discuss it, uh, uh, dwell on it. But, you know, this bill, uh, I think, is narrowly crafted specifically in response to what we have seen actually be the case. Not feature hypotheticals, but has been the case for a few years that has directly led uh, to some tragedies and too many kids ending, ending up in emergency rooms. Thank you. Any other uh, questions from the members? Seeing none, uh, Senator, you're close. Uh, would I respectfully ask for your I vote and tell my colleagues sitting in the front row that the Ventura County Board of Supervisors is in support of the bill. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been properly moved and seconded. Uh, please call the roll. Hall. All aye. All aye, Ms. Standy. Aye. Ms. Standy, aye. Atkins. Aye. Atkins, aye. Block. Aye. Block, aye. Bloomingfield. Chesbro. Aye. Chesbro, aye. Cook. Aye. Cook, aye. Galgiani. Aye. Galgiani, aye. Garrick. Gatto. Hill. Jeffries. Ma. Perea. Aye. Perea, aye. Perez. Aye. Perez, aye. Silva. Torres, Torres, aye, that bill's out. Uh, thank you, Senator, that bill is out. Mr. Chairman, may I make just yes. one quick comment? To this yes, matter? please. I just want to thank you for working with the small brewers. I had a number of uh, brewers last year that were uh, unhappy with uh, your approach, and you're working with them to take care of that problem. It's appreciated. Thank you, Senator. Uh, at this time, we'll call Senator Strickland, uh, SB 374. Welcome, Senator. Welcome, Mr. Chairman, members. Uh, SB 374 authorizes a key employee with a valid uh, personnel portable license to work as a key employee in any key employee position in more than one. It's been properly moved Second. and seconded. Uh, would you, uh, any questions from the members? No. Seeing and hearing none, Senator, you're close. I vote. All right, uh, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Hall. Hall, aye. Hall, aye. Nastandy? Aye. Nastandy, aye. Atkins? Aye. Atkins, aye. Block? Aye. Block, aye. Bloomingfield? Chesbro? Aye. Chesbro, aye. Cook? Aye. Cook, aye. Galgiani? Aye. Galgiani, aye. Garrick? Aye. Garrick, aye. Gatto? <coughs> Hill? Jeffries? Aye. Jeffries, aye. Ma? Perea? Aye. Perea, aye. Perez? Aye. Perez, aye. Silva? Aye. Silva, aye. Torres? Taurus, aye. Senator, I'm quite sure your witness wouldn't mind waiving her testimony. No, Very well. Uh, that bill is out, Senator. Thank you. <laughs> we are waiting on Senator Wolk and Senator Vargas. I said, do you want me to tell you about the event you missed? <laughs> no, please, not publicly. <laughs>
Senator Vargas, Senator Vargas, uh, SB 252, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you for allowing me to present SB 252. This bill would require a state agency that enters into a privatization contract of $500,000 or more to report the Department of General Services regarding those contracts, make those contract, make those reports available to the public, and require state agencies to submit specific information relating to their use of private contractors as part of the budget process. According to the Department of General Services in fiscal year 2009-2010, California spent approximately $35 billion on private contracts. However, much of this multi-billion dollar expenditure occurs without substantive government oversight, which could result in much wasted taxpayer money. SB 252 will ensure increased accountability, oversight, and public transparency. Mr. Chairman, I would ask for an I vote. Very well. You have witnesses here to testify. Yes, sir. Janice Norman, on behalf of the American Federation of State County and Municipal Employees, we respectfully ask for your I vote. Um, as it is pointed out in the analysis, the current information related to um, privatization contracts is woefully inadequate. It doesn't provide the legislature or the public with the needed um, information to sort of evaluate whether or not these privatizations are in the best interest of the state. We think this information goes a long way of providing the adequate tools to the legislature and to the public to make those correct evaluations. We ask for your I vote. Very well, thank you. Next witness. Well, Randy Cheek with SEIU Local 1000. Uh, as you know that uh, we feel transparency is one of our top issues. Uh, contrary to popular opinion, contracting out in most cases does not reduce cost. In fact, uh, we had a study done called the Hidden Branch of Government that identified nearly 350 million annual savings by using civil service employees rather than private contractors. So we, we, are, we believe that uh, having more transparency will show where some of these uh, contracts are and we can save the state a lot of money. And we ask for your eye vote. Well, thank you for your testimony. Uh, any other witnesses in support? Witnesses in opposition? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members. Mira Gurton here today on behalf of the California Chamber of Commerce in opposition to this measure. Um, we have been working for the last couple months, actually, to see if we can come to some agreement. At this point, we haven't yet been able to do so, although we continue uh, to see if there is some common ground. And we are generally supportive of the efforts of uh, Senator Vargas here to increase transparency. We like to see that in all areas of government to, make, to protect taxpayer dollars. Um, however, we believe SB 252 goes too far. This is the first time, at least that I know of, where we would actually be requiring that business-to-business -business contracts and agreements would be publicized, potentially on a website, but at least made available to the public by the Public Records Act. Um, in addition, we would also be publicizing private salary information. Um, I don't know if it still states names. I, I don't think it still does, but, um, but specifically getting into individual employees, including their salaries, and making that information available to uh, competitors and all people in the public. We believe that this information is proprietary for a lot of our members, and it is also private information um, that will harm the competitiveness of those firms. In addition, we think that a lot of these subcontracts reflect agreements that are much broader than any one individual state contract that they would then be used um, to provide information for. So it's not always relevant to the state contract at issue. Um, this will also discourage companies from bidding with the state, um, which could drive down the competitiveness and increase rates for the state of California. It's also unclear what benefit we get from putting subcontractor information up and individual salaries of private employees. The primary contracts show what the state received in its contract, what it paid for that, and, and give us all the information we need to know about whether they got a good deal and whether they should have been contracting out at all or whether it was a, more appropriate to use in-state services. Um, if the goal is to cut down on the profit margins, that's something that we potentially drive a lot of companies out of business with the state. If the goal is to... Uh, to prohibit subcontracts when the rates are too high, we potentially drive small businesses out of the market and make it so that only large companies would be able, large subcontractors would be available to bid on these because they can provide the lowest rates. And these are things that I think, you know, are kind of against a lot of the public policy we've promoted here. So in conclusion, sometimes more information is better, and oftentimes it is, but sometimes more information is just more information. And this is one of those times, in our opinion. Thank you very much. Very well, thank you. Next witness. 
Mr. Chair and members, Mark Smith on behalf of the American Council of Engineering Companies of California, wish to identify our concerns with the comments by the lobbyist for the chamber. Uh, we have concerns with the disclosure of subcontractor records. Uh, as she stated, this is the first time that the state would be requiring disclosure of business to business contracts, not the contract between the state and the prime contractor. Um, we're, we are an organization that supports government transparency and oversight in the process. As a matter of fact, we were strong supporters of Governor Schwarzenegger's Transparency in Government Executive Order. If you go to transparency.gov.ca, you can find a list of government contracts by agency and department. Uh, I was with Mr. Hill's staff the other day. We took a look at that list together. There are over 350 pages worth of contracts that are made publicly available on that website. It aggregates information from all those agencies and departments into one place. We believe this bill is largely duplicative of those efforts in this case. Additionally, I would like to point out to you that you know, there is a bill from one of your colleagues, AB 172, Assemblymember Ng, which codifies that executive order. Uh, we are fully supportive of that process and making sure that we continue to follow the example set by Governor Schwarzenegger. I, I would like to talk about one of the comments made by the sponsors of the legislation, and that is that we lack government oversight in the contracting process. I printed out and brought for you, I'm pretty sure none of you would like to read it, but this is the Caltrans audit procedure manual for anybody who enters into a contract with the Department of Transportation. It is 192 pages. This is not the audit. This is the manual and the procedure for how the audit is to take place. It is closely linked to federal guidelines. It has its own state guidelines. A contractor with the Department of Transportation is subject to an audit both pre- and post-contract. The Department of Transportation has its own division related to audits, in addition to the state auditor and whoever else may get involved in looking at those. So we would tell you that from our perspective there is a considerable amount of oversight um, some oversight in fact that the state auditor pointed out the department of transportation could use on its own the department of transportation cannot tell you how many people it has assigned to a particular project if we spent 10 percent of the resources that we do looking at the private sector looking internally we would have much better information about the way the state operates so for those reasons we respectfully oppose this bill unless amended thank you thank you next witness Kathy Van Austin, Rose and Kendall, representing Tech America, and um, appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Uh, when the state looks at uh, procurements and doing contracts with the te technology industry, uh, I'm sure every member on this committee has either heard or is, uh, if you've been here a while, uh, been through some of the, the debates about um, procurement and how that works. Um, when a company is putting together a bid for uh, any project, they're not only dealing with that department, they're dealing with the agency and they're dealing with Department of General Services. There is an incredible amount of oversight. And once you even win that bid, um, getting a contract signed and going line by line through that contract, I can, I can guarantee you I've painfully been through it with clients. Um, uh, the state does a, a, a very good job of protecting itself. That said, if you take, if you make it incumbent upon companies who are either partnering or subcontracting, um, as Mira mentioned, it uh, I think it will chill uh, the desire for some some companies to contract. It certainly would chill the desire for some of your subcontractors to step into the to, to the public sector within some of these contracts. So. Um, while I understand the bill is well intended, it impacts on the information that technology contracts with the state, I think could, could truly backfire. And for those reasons, Tech America opposes the bill. Thank you. Next witness. Eve Pukowski representing TechNet, and we'd like to associate ourselves with some of the, with many of the remarks made by earlier witnesses. Um, in addition, I'd like to say that uh, TechNet members would very much like to continue to work with, Senator, with the Senator's office to try to come to a solution that um, and uh, that is mutually acceptable to all of us. Thank you. Very well, thank you. Uh, any other uh, witnesses in opposition? Um, Mr. Hill. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Vargas, I, this, the bill sounds, uh, you know, how can anyone debate or argue against good transparency in, in government or in contracting? But I know in, in the, uh, the opposition they've talked and discussed some amendments that have been proposed. Are there, if you could kind of, 
tell us what, what the problem is with the amendments and if you're willing to continue to look to see if we can come to some common ground with them on that? First of all, I want to thank you for the question and, and thank the people that are here. In fact, we have been working on them. We have made some amendments. Uh, we had first, it was $100,000 that these, these contracts were valued. We went to, to $500,000, some of the comments that were made. Um, also, individuals' names are out. Uh, there are other things, I think, that, that, that we could work on. However, the, the juxtaposition of the, the case is that I, I do think that it's the public's money, and the public should know where the money's going and how it's being spent. And there's, you can only go so far and, and not obfuscate where that money is going. And I think it's important that the public do have this information. So I'm, I'm happy to continue to work for them. They're, they've done a great job of bringing a lot of the issues up, but I don't know that we're going to get to a full agreement, uh, frankly. Well, I mean, and again, I, I would emphasize, too, that it's interesting that the transparency that they want to see in government, they don't seem to want to see for government contracts. I think that there's a little bit of a, an equal playing field there. Well, I don't know if, if that's the case, but I... I, I, you know, I'm going to support the bill for you today, but I, I, it would be, you know, I think, beneficial to continue the discussion if, if you'd be kind enough uh, to see if we can make it. To, we always like to have things work for as many people as possible when we have a, a bill finally get out of here. So if you could, I'd appreciate it. So, Senator, I'm happy to do that and happy to work with you, too, if you're, there's some concerns there that you have. Happy Th to do that. Thank you, Senator. Appreciate it. Very well. Mr. Nostandi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think all of us up here are in favor of transparency and the appropriateness of that. But my concern with the bill is it's a, a case of really micromanaging. You, you hire a department or an agency head to hire the right people to make the right decisions on running their department. So if there's money to be saved, we have to assume uh, that they're operating in that manner. So if it's, I guess my my common question might be to your question behind the the bill is are you assuming that there's nefarious deals going on that their cronyism is is occurring or what would be the fear in, in the current operation and why would we want to get involved in how a department is run and and if we don't do we not trust the managers then to operate their departments in good faith and, and find the best service for the best price Thank you. I like the way Reagan said, trust but verify. Of course we trust them. We just want to verify that that's the case. That's why we want this information. It's interesting. It's the same information that we provide in the public records request. So all we're doing is, you know, saying if it's, it's good for government, it ought to be good for the contracts that the government has. So that's what we're attempting to do here, not that we don't trust department heads or anything like that. I think Reagan said it best, trust and verify. Let's get the information. Let's make it transparent. Let's make sure that everyone gets an opportunity to take a look at it. Do you, do you appreciate the fact though, that private companies uh, are private for a particular reason? They want to keep information private, and so therefore it might not be appropriate for them to open up all their books to the public <clears throat> because they are a private company. And there are certain trade secrets or methods and, and ways they operate their business that keep a competitive edge, and they, and they certainly don't want to expose that to their competitors. Yeah, I, I came from the private sector. I'm quite familiar with private companies as vice president, Fortune 90 company. So I'm quite familiar with a lot of the trade secrets and copyrights and all the other protections that companies have. At the same time, I do understand that this is different. This is the government's money. This is the people's money. And the people's money does have different scrutiny than you have simply two private companies making a deal. This isn't a private company making a deal with another private company. This is the people making a deal with the private company. And I think that there should be much more disclosure there. There should be much more transparency. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Garrick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Senator. As thank a fellow you, San Diegan, I, like you, and has been echoed by many of my colleagues here, like to uh, think that all of us support transparency in a free nation to have free flow of information while still being respectful of privacy matters. And, uh, and as you've articulated, this is uh, public dollars. But this level of uh, information provides a degree of power and uh, let's say um, extra leverage uh, for anyone having this information when you're delving into what uh, a general contractor may be paying his subcontractors, what his subcontractors are paying his own employees, that level of information and other things that this bill requires go far, far beyond the reach of what um, the free market and what we as citizens in the state of California would want to achieve, and that's the products and services that we want for a fair price, a legal price, but not one that 
could, in the long run, or even the short, immediate run, lead to um, the destruction of competition to achieve that fair price. Uh, disclosure of proprietary information is one deep concern that this bill, I believe, crosses the line of what is proprietary and should remain proprietary when a subcontractor or even a general contractor bids on a state project. Uh, the sensitivity of that information, I believe, will, as I said, discourage uh, competition among the bidders. Uh, it could be harmful to businesses that are trying to do um, a good job for the state in providing those products and services and being competitive uh, as other individuals now have the private proprietary information, what they're paying their employees or what um, they're paying their subcontractors. And I think eventually in the long run and maybe in the immediate uh, it would drive up the cost of doing businesses, and it would eliminate the private sector in many cases from even bidding or in some cases from being competitive uh, and providing the services that the state may uh, and does need from the private sector on a as-needed basis. And for that reason, I feel uh, that this bill needs considerable more work and would encourage you to think about that because I'm not going to be able to support it today, Senator. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jeffries. Yeah, many of my questions have been raised already, but it, I do applaud the effort on the transparency. Um, the legislature could learn a lot from doing more in a transparent manner. Uh, you know, there's a lot of commentary could be offered and reading budgets as you walk out onto the floor. Um, uh, the problem with the bill, while the intention I think is good for transparency, is the perception is this is, an, this is an attack on the private sector, that the goal with this bill, whether you intend it to be that way or not, uh, as stated by some of the supporters, the goal is to eliminate some of the private sector uh, from being able to do work. The goal is to, by some, to replace the private sector. And I think at a time when California is in such terrible financial shape, to have the legislature send the message out that we want to do harm to the private sector, that we want to make it more difficult, is probably not the message that the legislature should be sending right now, if at any time. I, I don't know how you get around that uh, when some of the supporters are so blatant about that effort to replace the private sector. It takes, I think the last number I heard, 24 private sector employees to pay enough taxes to pay for one public employee. If we continue to erode away at our private sector, there won't be enough people to pay the taxes to, to support the public sector. There has to be room, and I don't think your bill intends to eliminate it, but there has to be room for the private sector to compete with the monopoly that the public sector sometime has. And on a, on a very, very personal, small level, low level of budget dust to even below that, just for us as legislators. If, if we want to get our office painted in this building, two cans of paint for $40, we can't go to the private sector to have an office painted. We have to have it done by a public employee at $1,100 for $45 worth of paint. If we want to have a shelf put in our office for $30 from Home Depot, it's $400 to have it hung. $420, I'm sorry. Um, if we're going to do this comparison, if we're going to open this door and say, let's have an assault on the private sector, well, then we need to have an open door that says the private sector can also compete in all arenas and we'll, we'll have a, a straight open contest. But we know that's not what's going to happen here. So again, I applaud the effort on the transparency. I think it's great, but it's, that isn't part of the drill that's behind this by some of the supporters. And, and when you close, I would appreciate you trying to reassure me that even despite what their letters say in their package, that's not what's really the intent here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Assemblywoman Atkins. Thank you very much. And Senator, thank you for being here today. I just wanted to offer a little bit pers of perspective from a different point of view. I, I think this is a healthy debate and a, a pretty interesting discussion, but I'm not surprised uh, that you're from San Diego, Senator. Um, having served at the local level, and, and I want to point out, this is where the public sector meets the private sector, which is the point we dealt with when I was on the city council after uh, you were gone. 
uh, a number of contracts that were, you know, uh, basically in downtown related to Center City Development Corporation and, in fact, with the city with private sector um, companies. And the public wants to know. I, I think that's, that's the other piece when this is public sector or when this is public dollars and you are contracting and you know we went through a period of time where we're, we really thought that this was this was really not um, you know that there should be some manner of privacy until we looked at some of the contracts and began to see that they were scrutinized and that the taxpayers weren't getting the best deal in some cases and it gave us an opportunity to have a public discussion about what types of services uh, you have to go find uh, the right type of contractor and some specialty services, particularly financial services at a time when San Diego was dealing with some huge issues. And, and uh, you know, I think at the end of the day, it was a rough period of time, but it helped educate the public, too. Um, and so I think this is a discussion that's going to become bigger and bigger across the country. And um, I think in San Diego, we saw how it played out and that the transparency was actually, at the end of the day, a good thing uh, for the taxpayers. And at the end of the day, um, it didn't diminish uh, private uh, companies from bidding uh, to get work. And in fact, uh, I think the outcome was good. So I applaud you for this. And I think it, it, it is an important discussion. But I think the public really does want to know what's happening with their dollars and they're getting the best deal and the best bang for the buck. Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I don't think I could have closed any better. The public has a right to know. And that's really what this bill attempts to do. Um, a notion that there's an assault in this bill, an assault on the private sector, or, quote, or an attack on the public sector is not the case. I mean, if you read the bill, there's nothing in there that, that does that. There's nothing that prohibits the private sector from bidding. It simply sheds light on it. That's what, uh, that's what this bill does. I think it deserves your eye vote. I, I just couldn't help but say that we, a quote that we should follow the example set by Governor Schwarzenegger. I in no way want to follow the example set by Governor Schwarzenegger. That's in case my wife's watching. <laughs> in, in my community, we say, I'm not going to touch that. That's right. And I'm uh, going to ask for your eye vote. <laughs> that, that's, that's MC Hammer. <laughs> Mr. Silva, uh, for another quick question. Real quick, real quick uh, comment. Uh, Senator, I, I do have the utmost respect for you. I, I followed your career. And um, on this item, I know that, uh, that we might have a, a different way of looking at it. In this country, um, I really feel that, that we have a very high standard of living because we have competition. That's what makes this country great. And when you look at the factors of production and as a private citizen, we want to buy something, we usually want to get the, the best deal. Not necessarily the lowest price, but what would be the best deal for us. And if there's a company that's in competition and they have uh, one of the factors, land, labor, and capital, that's uh, better than their competitor, then they're probably going to be able to make a widget much cheaper. And maybe as a, a private citizen, we don't have the right to know exactly what their secrets are as long as they're within the law. And uh, I, I feel that, uh, that you're trying to do the right thing, but I feel that uh, it might be it might be overreaching. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Senator, this is a, a due pass recommendation by the chair. Uh, there is, as you see, a lot of concern mm -hmm. uh, as it relates to this bill. Certainly, I do believe transparency uh, is critical. However, I won't, there, there are some very sensitive issues that were addressed here by the opposition, Mr. Hill and others, Mr. Garrick and others, on both sides. And so uh, I would encourage you to deeply, deeply uh, work with the opposition in hopes of coming up with some type of uh, resolution to the concerns that were addressed here today. Uh, this is a uh, due pass uh, recommendation to BNP. Uh, again, I, I, I cannot over express my concern and ask that you, in fact, work with uh, the opposition in working out some of the details mentioned today as we move this bill along to uh, BMP. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll I have your this. commitment with that. Yes, absolutely. And in fact, I want to say that they've been great to work with. They have brought a lot of concerns forward. We have changed the bill in many ways, and I don't know that we'll ultimately be able to get to a complete agreement, but I certainly want to continue to work with them. Very well. Uh, is there a motion? 
It's been moved. Is there a second? It's been properly second. Uh, Madam uh, Clerk, please call the roll. Hall. Hall, aye. Hall, aye. And Estandy? No. Estandy, no. Atkins? Aye. Atkins, aye. Block? Aye. Block, no. aye. Bloomingfield? Chesbro? Aye. Chesbro, aye. Cook? No. Cook, no. Galgiani? Aye. Galgiani, aye. Garrick? No. Garrick, no. Gatto? Gatto, aye. Hill? Aye. Hill, aye. Jeffries? No. Jeffries, no. Ma? Ma, aye. Perea? Priya, aye. Press. Aye. Press, aye. Silva? No. Silva, no. Torres? Aye. Torres, aye. That bills out. Okay, Senator, that bills out. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Senator. Uh, item five, Senator Wolk. Uh, I believe that's SB 339. Nine. It's been moved and seconded, but however, I. I, I the, the <laughs> Wait a minute. Thank you. Senator? <laughs> All right. Um, 339 will enable cooking school, two things cooking schools to apply for a beer and wine license from Alcohol ABC. And number two, to allow the city-owned community centers that are located on public school grounds to serve alcohol at events when students aren't present. And I have um, Steve Reynolds, who's a board member of the Davis Food Co-op, to tell you about the cooking schools and the fact that they can't serve alcohol okay. in an educational setting. And Laura Parra, who represents the city of West Sac, they have this wonderful community center. It happens to be on school grounds, but they have a lot of community events. So I ask for your I vote. Absolutely. Uh, first uh, witness and support. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Steve Reynolds. I'm a director of the Davis Food Co-op. As part of the Davis Food Co-op, we operate a teaching kitchen and have about 25 classes a day. Davis, as you know, is a center of wine and food education and would really like to be able to expand our offerings to include classes that include wine pairings, for example. Laura. Laura Parr, representing the city of West Sacramento. The city was going to be having a fundraiser last year, but unfortunately they were not able to because the city attorney informed them of the, it's not clarified in law. They were going to raise over $25,000 at that fundraising event, and they were not able to do so. So this bill would clarify uh, existing law and um, help other cities in doing that. So, Very well. Uh, Mr. Hill? Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, one of the concerns, and I've, this issue has come up in, in my district of having, you know, f events in, on school property or in school facilities after hours and alcohol being served. And one of the concerns that has always come to mind for, for me was if alcohol is being served and let's say someone leave, goes into a restroom uh, in that facility or someone leaves a glass of alcohol or a bottle somewhere and it's behind something no one sees it and then school starts and Monday and someone finds that bottle and drinks it uh, I mean and so I don't know what the you know how that can be resolved I mean that, that's been the issue or the troubling part for me about the alcohol so I don't know if that's being taken care of or if there are some provisions and or it just when it's in the same location, it just is a little concern. I mean, I, I, I'll support the bill because I think it's it's certainly worth a try and, and an attempt to see if we can um, resolve because I think there's a need for it in that sense. But you're all looking at me as if I have a good answer. <laughs> and I don't know if there is an follow. answer, Senator. I, I, there may not be, but it's just a, an issue. And, and I would running, hope people uh, who would yeah. be okay. using this and and uh, utilizing the facilities mm -hmm. and with alcohol would would use due diligence in making sure that that particular concern doesn't arise. I think that is probably the only way you can you can control that. I mean, those those that run the center um, uh, and those who have the events need to make absolutely certain that they return the facility in the condition uh, in which it was granted and as part of the agreement that you have with the nonprofit or whomever is having that event, uh, it seems to me you want to make sure that it's returned in good condition and that would mean without bottles hidden in the left in the restroom. Yeah, right, exactly. And you'd need to check. Thank you, Senator. Uh, uh, Assembly uh, Woman Atkins. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you, Senator. I had some questions yes, that were did. answered, and uh, I, I just want to thank your staff for being so quick to respond. I support the bill, and just I really appreciate your taking the time. Thank you. My pleasure. Assemblyman Chesbrough. 
I'm pleased to be a co-author on this bill, and uh, while it's very important for us to keep alcohol out of the hands of minors, and it's very important for us to have all of the programs in place to combat uh, alcohol abuse and alcoholism, um, it's important to remember that compared to any other uh, industrialized nation in the Western world, we have layer upon layer upon layer of restriction on those who are in the business of manufacturing and selling alcohol. And it's not an easy business to be in. And uh, I think this is uh, a, a small example of, uh, of uh, how we can make life a little easier for those folks without really uh, creating uh, new problems or uh, uh, that we, we should be concerned about. So I'm, I'm pleased to, uh, to support this motion. Very well. Um, any other uh, questions, comments from the members? Senator, you're close. I just ask for your I vote. Thank you, staff, and you for your um, cooperation and working with us so closely. Thank you. Very well. Uh, is there a mo was that a motion, Mr. Chesbrough? Yes. It's been properly moved and seconded. Uh, please call the roll. Hall. And this is recommended to pass to Assembly Appropriations. Hall, aye. Hall, aye. Nastandy? Aye. Nastandy, aye. Atkins? Aye. Atkins, aye. Block? Bloomingfield? Chesbrough? Aye. Espro I Cook. Aye. Cook I Galgiani. Aye. Galgiani I Garrick. Aye. Garrick I Gatto. Gatto I Hill. Aye. Hill I Jeffries. Aye. Jeffries I Ma. Aye. Ma I Prea. Aye. Prea I Press. Aye. Press I Silva. Aye. Silva I Torres. Aye. Torres I. Very well, uh, Senator, that bill is out. We will leave the roll open for the absent members and for the present members who relate to add on. Thank you. 